In the last video, we kicked things off by setting up the core of our 6502 build. The big design difference between Ben Eater's Breadboard 6502 build and our machine is that we included a bunch of multiplexes on the address lines so other circuits can access the memory, not just the 6502. Now, what if I told you that by just using a handful of simple logic chips and some EEPROMs, we can start to drive a real video output to the display without any specialized hardware or FPGAs? Sounds pretty cool, right? By the end of this video, we'll build a simple Rust generator that can output a red square straight to the monitor before we start outputting real data. To build the display system, we're going to need some counters. Now, I could use some binary counter chips like the 74LS161 which is what Ben Eater does in his very popular video series. And I've built a simple binary counter based on these chips here. We can see the binary count occurring. This is Ben Eater's design for his video card. This is for the horizontal scan. And we can see the 74LS161s on the left. And he has all of this logic on the right, which generates the signals going to the monitor. Same with the vertical scan. The count feeds into an EEPROM, which drives the display, and we get an image. Now, this is a great circuit, and it's easy to understand. But, there's a lot of complexity in the 74LS161 chips, which Ben Eden doesn't really go over in any detail. Now, I'm going to presume that you're familiar with simple gates, like inverters, AND gates, OR gates, NAND and NOR gates. I also expect you to be on top of D-type flip-flops. If this is all new to you, then I suggest you check out this playlist first, where I go over these simple concepts using electromechanical relays. OK, let's say I want to build a counter out of simpler parts than a 74LS161. What I need is a circuit which, given any binary number, can compute the binary number plus 1. I can do this with a chain of half adders. Each subunit takes carry from the last stage, an input bit, and we use the following rules to decide what to do. Now, the first three cases are exactly the same as regular decimal logic. 0 plus 0 carry equals 0, and carry out a 0. 0 plus 1 equals 1, carry 0. 1 plus 0 equals 1, carry 0. But here's where things change. Normally, 1 plus 1 equals 2, but we can't have 2 in binary. So instead, we have 1 plus 1 equals 0, carry 1. You might have noticed that this is a NAND gate, and this is an exclusive OR gate. So we need a pair of these gates per bit. If we have a binary number, n, coming in on the left, we get a binary number, n plus 1, on the right. This is all great, but we need some way to store the number between clock signals. For this, we're going to need a bank of flip-flops. The output from the flip-flops is our binary number n. This feeds back to the input of the logic, and n plus 1 is presented to the input of the flip-flops, but this only gets latched internally and outputted on the next positive edge of clock. We can update this circuit to be a counter by adding an octal D-type flip-flop. So I've made this circuit here out of red LEDs, and we can see that at least for counting up, it operates exactly the same way as the 74LS161s. So far, so good. But there is another way of counting up. Let's say, instead of having this chain of exclusive OR and AND gates compute N plus 1, I just store the value of N plus 1 in an EEPROM. I feed N into the address lines, and out of the data lines come N plus 1, which are pre-computed. Now our circuit looks like this. A bank of flip-flops on the right. The output N feeds into the EEPROM. The EEPROM does the lookup and outputs N plus 1, which it then presents to the flip-flops. On the next positive edge of clock, this gets latched and outputted. I've built this, and this is our third circuit here. Why might I want to do that? Well, it gives me a lot more flexibility in the design. Let's say I want to count by threes. That's pretty easy with the EEPROM, but it requires more chips if I want to do that with the conventional logic. This is great but I'm kind of limited to counting between 0 and 255 with this design. What if I want a larger count, say between 0 and 65,535? Then what I need to do is use two EEPROMs in parallel, which gives me a 16-bit output. 
This feeds into a bank of 16 flip-flops here in the form of two octal D-type flip-flop chips. Then all 16 bits from the flops feed back into the address lines of both EEPROMs. I've effectively doubled the output width of the EEPROMs from 8 bits to 16 bits. Well, this is exactly what I'm going to build as the raster generator for the VIC-20. The difference here is that while these outputs do feed back to the input lines on the EEPROMs, some, but not all, of the address lines also feed into the address multiplex that we built in the last video. Back to the build. In the lower part of the screen, we have two EEPROMs in the middle, and the Octal D-type flip-flops are on the side. Now, the data from the EEPROM goes directly into the flip-flops, and this is shown with the red wires. But the outputs are a bit more complicated. These are the raster addresses, which I'm wiring up with blue wire. The trick here is that none of the raster address signals need to feed back into the address multiplexer we built in the last video. The wiring to the multiplexer is already getting a bit dense, so we're going to need some fine wiring skills here. I'm wiring in the address multiplexer now, but we won't actually be using the static RAM attached to the 6502 until next video. For the moment, I just want to get the monitor to lock onto the sync signals in this video. In the last video, I said there was a trick to this sort of wiring. Well, the trick is that you pre-stretch the wire before cutting it. Take the insulation off one end and generally stretch the wire only by about 1 or 2%. Too much and it breaks. Then when you cut it, the insulation moves freely over the wire. Once the design is solid, we can move it over to printed circuit boards, which will be much easier to build. But during the prototype phase, I like to use this method. An alternate method is the approach James Sharman takes, which is to prototype on breadboards. Then, once a section of the design is debugged, move it over to a printed circuit board. I don't think there's any one right way of prototyping with this older technology, but this tends to suit me best. I've actually been wiring this way since I owned a VIC-20 back in the 80s. My first VIC-20 memory expansion was wired up using this technique. The raster buses RA0 through 15. Just for this video, RA0 through 15 is interchangeable with A0 through 15. Okay, I've got this highly programmable counter, but how do I turn it into a raster generator? Now, I'm going to apologise to my regular viewers who have seen this graphic a number of times, but I need to go over it for those new to the channel. To understand how the raster generator in a machine like the VIC-20 works, we need to look at the cathode ray tube that it controls. This is a glass tube, which has a vacuum inside. At the back of the tube is a heated wire, which emits free electrons, and these are accelerated towards the front of the screen using an electric field, creating a beam of electrons. This part of the cathode ray tube is called an electron gun. The front of the tube is covered with phosphor. When the electrons hit the front of the screen, the energy in the electron beam excites some of the phosphor, which then glows, which we humans, and many other animals, see as visible light. But how do we make a picture? Well, at the side of the tube there are some electromagnets, and these can actually steer the electron beam left, right, up and down. Using these electromagnets and some clever analog electronics, we can guide the electron beam in a sweeping pattern called a raster scan. Now, there's one more trick to all of this. It turns out we can turn the electron beam on and off really quickly. Using a sweeping pattern and the ability to turn the beam on and off, we can generate an image one line at a time. Each of these lines is called a scan line. Now, the beam scans left to right at a certain rate, and we use a dot clock to keep track of where it is in the scan line. Once we hit the right edge of the screen, we need to tell the beam to go back to the left side and down a little. The signal that does this is called horizontal sync. Similarly, as we go down the image, we eventually get to the bottom right of the screen, and a different signal called vertical sync tells the circuitry to send the beam back to the top left. 
This means to drive the display, we need a video signal timed with the dot clock, which turns the electron beam on and off, and we also need a horizontal and vertical sync signal to control the raster sweep. The production VIC-20 can drive either an NTSC or a PAL signal, but I'm blaming to use VGA. In VGA, we actually have three electron guns. One illuminates red phosphor, one for green phosphor, and another for the blue phosphor. These electron guns are controlled by these three signals on the VGA port. We also send horizontal and vertical sync directly to the port as well. Normally, for VGA, the dot clock's 25.175 MHz, but we can use a slower dot clock if we want. What's not negotiable is the horizontal sync rate, which is 31.5 kHz, and the vertical sync rate, which is 60 Hz. For the horizontal timing, the sync pulse is 96 out of 800 pixels, or 12% of a scan line, and vertical sync is two scan lines. All right, so let's get down to business with the VIC-20. Normally, it has a 22 by 23 character display with 8 by 8 pixel characters. Now, this is programmable in the VIC chip, and we'll deal with that later, but for now, we'll just get the standard display working. 22 by 23 characters of 8 by 8 pixels is 176 by 184 active pixels, plus the border region. While the display is 176 pixels wide, I know the horizontal total is 260 pixels, which means 260 times 15750, which is the NTSC vSync rate, is a little over 4 MHz. Now, it does make the design simpler if I use a multiple of 8 for the total number of horizontal pixels. So I'm going to use 256 instead of 260, which corresponds to 32 8 pixel characters. 256 times 31.5 kHz, which is the VGA HSync rate, gives us a dot clock of just over 8 MHz. Now there is a little bit of wobble allowed in these signals, so an 8 MHz dot clock should be enough. The standard VIC-20 resolution has 184 vertical active scan lines, but I've got 525 available in VGA, so I'm going to do a 1 to 2 stretch vertically to make it 368 active scan lines. How does this relate to our EEPROM base counter? Well, if we look at our counter, we can conceptualize it as a bunch of boxes, where each box points to the next box. Then, when we get to 255, we circle back to zero. Now, although technically the EEPROM is a one-dimensional array of memory, we can rearrange it to be a two-dimensional array if we want, which is 32 characters wide and 525 scan lines high. The active area is 22 characters by 368 scan lines, which includes the 1 to 2 stretch of the normal 184 scan lines, so I'll carve that out of our array. Next, the remaining area's border. Then, within the border region, I need to add some sync signals. Each sync is four characters wide, but I need a blank character either side of it. And similarly, I need two scan lines for vertical sync. I'm going to place these in the middle of our border region to centralize the image. Now, I could just map it into an EEPROM like this, with A0 through A4 up the top, and A5 through A15 down the side. But there are two problems with this. First, we want the active area to be one continuous block of memory. Whereas with this scheme, it's all broken up with the green horizontal border and HSync. Second, using this mapping, we're still going to need some complex logic to detect the start and end of HSync and VSync. What I'm going to do instead is map the different regions to different locations within the EEPROM. Now, this is somewhat arbitrary. First, I'm going to map the even scan lines to location 0 hex and the odd scan lines to location 2000 hex. The 22 by 23 character matrix address will use A0 through A8, while the 8 scan lines in a character will map to A9 through A11. Next, I'm going to map the horizontal border to 4000 hex and the vertical border to 8000 hex. Again, this is a little arbitrary, but it means I can use the same code for the raster generator used in the ZX Spectrum project. Finally, the sync regions will map to C1000 hex. Now, each location in the EEPROM points to the next address to go to. If we follow the first scan line, we start in the active area for an even numbered scan line. We go from 0 to 21. Then, at location 21, we next jump to location 4000 hex, which is in the horizontal border region. 
we keep on going along the scan line. I haven't shown it here, but we also jump in and out of the sync region in this section. At character 31 in the scan line, we jump to the same scan line in the odd region and trace it through. We keep doing this in raster order, jumping between the regions until we get to the bottom scan line, which is in the vertical border. We scoot through this scan line, and at the end, we jump back to location 0, and start scanning out the next frame. It's very much like a circular linked list. So, why do I do this? Well, it makes the logic really simple. A0 through A8 is the character address, which is contiguous like the VIC chip. A9 through 11 is the scan line number. A14 Nord with A15 is our active signal. When this is high, it means we're in the active part of the display. A14 and with A15 means we're in the sync region, but we've got a little bit more to do before we get the signals we need. When A14 and A15 are both high, the address is in the range C1000 to FFFF. Now, the first 4K is for blanking. Specifically, I need a blank character either side of the H-Sync signal to keep the monitor happy. Next, A12 is used for H-Sync, so H-Sync is asserted from D1000 to DFFF, and also from F1000 to FFFF. A13 I use for V-Sync, which means E1000 to EFFF is for V-Sync only, while F1000 to FFFF is for when both V-Sync and H-Sync are asserted. The main purpose of this video is to get the raster generated to make the VGA H-Sync and V-Sync signals that the monitor can lock onto. To generate V-Sync bar, we can use another gate, a NAND gate this time, to detect when A13, A14 and A15 are all high. Additionally, we use a second NAND gate for H-Sync bar, which detects when A12, A14 and A15 are all high. This is good. We pass these signals through some resistors, then onto our VGA port. But we want to display something on the screen to make sure it works. So what I'm going to do is pass the active signal through another resistor and connect it to the red signal on the VGA port. If all goes well, we should see a big red square on the screen. I've made a program to do this mapping and generate the EEPROMs, which is available on GitHub. It also outputs a graphical display for checking the contents of the EEPROM. White is the current scan line. Red is active. Green is the horizontal border. Blue is the vertical border. Blacks for H-Sync and V-Sync. And yellow represents the blank guard characters on either side of H-Sync. The code to make this starts with a bunch of hash defines for all the constants. Next, we clear the EEPROM, then sweep through all the rows and columns. For each row and column address, we compute the EEPROM address for this location and the EEPROM address for the character immediately to its right. Then we store the second value in the EEPROM at the location of the first value. Inside the compute address routine, we first detect the right side of the raster scan and set it back to zero, then advance down one scan line. If we're at the bottom right, the next position is zero, which is the top left. Next, if we're in the active region, we compute the matrix address and the scan line within the character. If that's all good, we return. After this, we check to see whether we're in the sync region. If we're in H sync, we compute the address for that. Otherwise, we must be in V sync, and we compute that address. But what about the case where both H sync and V sync are asserted? Well, this is handled in the H sync code. After that, we test to see whether we're a guide character on either side of H sync and deal with that. If we get past all these if statements, then we must be in the horizontal or vertical border. Again, this code's available on GitHub and it compiles under Visual Studio 22, which is free from Microsoft. All right, let's burn the EEPROM and give it a go. This is H-Sync bar, which is four microseconds wide and occurs every 32 microseconds, which is exactly what we'd expect for a 31.5 kilohertz signal. V-Sync bar is occurring every 16 and a half-ish milliseconds, which is close enough to what we'd expect for a 60 hertz V-Sync rate. I'm going to declare victory on generating H-Sync and V-Sync signals. What we see here is the board generating the red square, which means the monitors have locked onto our H-Sync and V-Sync signals. At the moment, the monitor is in 16x9 mode, but I'll switch to 4x3 mode after this. Excellent! In the next video, We'll look at tying this in together with our 6502 so we can see what it's writing to memory.